everyone this is your girl texas black diamond and welcome to the channel um like i've been saying it's never a dull moment in the the circus of a mess that is going on here and we can't do nothing but say hard prayers for robert right now because everything that we're looking at is a mess everything is a mess and i just started peeping game um when i you know looked up the information for um don russell and of course you know they're trying to add it to the case and bring it to judge Dunley's attention and i feel like with that i think that that gave her the go ahead and, and the push to, um, you know, just mute the defense team from learning who these um, potential jurors are. And to me, I'm like, that's it's, it's wrong on all levels. For the simple fact, my question is, okay, why are you guys doing this? Is it you're trying to place people in, you know? And, and do this a, a dirty way and everything you know that i've been looking at has been just pure pure dirty just just dirt and so i just wanted to try to throw up something real quick you know i'm just getting off work and just looking at all this stuff and it just it's a hot mess so um i'll let you um hear the um letter that they wrote to re um resign a uh, judge for um Don Russell, and then we'll talk about motion and lemonade. United States District Court, Eastern District of New York, 225 Cadman Plaza, East Brooklyn, New York, 11201. The Honorable Ann M. Donnelly, United States District Court, Eastern District of New York, 225 Cadman Plaza, East Brooklyn, New York, 11201. Re, United States v. Donald Russell, Criminal Docket, Number 20, Dear Clerk of Court and Judge Donnelly. Pursuant to Local Rule 50.3.2, the government hereby notifies the court that the above-captioned case, Russell, is presumptively related to United States v. Robert Sylvester Kelly, No. 19-286, AMD, Kelly. Local Rule 50.3.2b.1 provides for a presumption that one case is related to another when the facts of each arise out of the same charged criminal schemes, transactions, or events, even if different defendants are involved in each case. Local Rule 50.3.2c.1 directs the United States Attorney's Office to give notice to all relevant judges whenever it appears that one case may be presumptively related to another pursuant to Section B-1. This letter constitutes the notice directed by Local Rule 50.3.2 C-1. This case is presumptively related to Kelly because the facts of Russell's case arise out of the same criminal events as charged in Kelly. Specifically, in Russell, Russell is charged with interstate stalking of a witness in Kelly, including after the individual was disclosed as a victim witness in Kelly. Two, while Kelly is not currently charged with interstate stalking of the witness, the government expects that, at Kelly's trial, the government will present evidence regarding Kelly's knowledge of and involvement in Russell's conduct underlying the interstate stalking charge as evidence regarding the racketeering enterprise charged in Kelly. As the case is thus presumptively related, the government respectfully submits that reassignment would be appropriate, as it would likely result in a significant savings of judicial resources and serve the interests of justice. Respectfully submitted, Seth D.D.U.C.H.A.R.M.E. Acting United States Attorney. Motions in limine. A motion in limine is a request by a party to the court for an order to limit or prevent certain evidence from being presented by the other side at trial. Generally, this motion is filed before trial, but a motion may also be presented during the trial before the particular evidence is presented to the jury. The purpose of a motion in limine is to prevent irrelevant, inadmissible, 
or prejudicial evidence from being presented to the jury. Most objections to the admissibility of evidence are asserted at the time the evidence is offered at trial, allowing the jury to hear the question and the witness's answer prior to the objection or even allowing the party's attorney to refer to the evidence at issue in the opening statement. A motion in limine filed in advance of the trial completely prevents the evidence from being presented in front of the jury whatsoever. A common motion in limine that is filed prior to trial will seek to exclude evidence of past criminal convictions, which are not admissible unless they are felony convictions within the last 10 years. In the absence of the motion in limine, the defense counsel may question the plaintiff about misdemeanor convictions and therefore present evidence of a criminal record to the jury. An objection can be made at the time of the questioning. The judge may sustain the objection and instruct the jury to disregard the question. However, the damage has been done because the jury cannot possibly ignore what they have already heard. The better trial strategy for the plaintiff's counsel is to file a motion in limine preventing such questions at trial. Furthermore, even though evidence may be admissible, the prejudicial nature may allow it to be excluded. For example, gruesome photographs of the legitimate nature and extent of the plaintiff's injuries may be considered to be unduly influential and it may unduly influence the jury's decision in favor of a plaintiff. A motion in limine may be granted to exclude such evidence. A motion in limine may also challenge an expert witness's qualifications, therefore preventing the expert witness from giving an opinion to the jury. The court will set a hearing and decide this issue prior to trial. The first answer is, what is a motion in limine? A motion in limine is a way to prevent inadmissible evidence from having an unfairly prejudicial impact on the jury. Let's make this definition a little bit clear by way of example. Let's say you're representing a plaintiff and your plaintiff is a drug dealer and that information or that fact came out during a deposition. At some point, you call your plaintiff up there on the stand, you conduct your direct examination, and then opposing counsel during their cross-examination asks this question. You're a drug dealer, correct? Now, that is not a good fact that you want to come out because the jury is immediately going to start discrediting the testimony coming from your particular plaintiff. That's not good, that's not what you want. So this gets to the point of a motion to limine. If the very fact that your client is a drug dealer has no bearing on the case, is not relevant whatsoever, then you're gonna wanna stand up and make your objection to the judge. If the judge sustains your objection and agrees with you, then the issue you have is that the jury just heard this fact. So you can try and remedy this potential unfairly prejudicial fact by asking the judge to instruct the jury to disregard that fact and disregard that question. But the issue there is, are they really gonna put it out of their mind that your client is a drug dealer? You know how the saying goes, you can't unring the bell. So the problem really is the fact that the question was asked in the first place. That's when the motion of limine comes into play. So to circle back to prior lessons, if we look at the working document that we made that lists all the bad facts for our case, what we wanna do with our motion of limine is figure out which of those bad facts will end up, just by the mentioning of them, biasing the jury. If you can take those facts, you're gonna to wanna to put them in your motion in limine and you're gonna to wanna to address them specifically. In doing so, whenever you identify a bad fact in your motion in limine, be sure to also, for each specific one, list your legal basis and explain why. Also keep in mind that as you go through the rules of evidence and you try and find a reason why this bad fact is inadmissible, you always wanna have the ultimate fallback, which is rule 403. In fact, you probably wanna have rule 403 objections for every single bad fact because that's the ultimate catch-all. Now, we will talk about rule 403 in other objections and other lessons, but if you wanna go ahead and get your rule 403 fix, be sure to check out my YouTube video that talks about the arguments that need to be made whenever you make the rule 403 objection. Also, keep in mind, and this is important because a lot of people, I think, get this issue confused. If the judge ends up granting a motion in limine on a specific request, that does not mean that the particular piece of evidence is inadmissible. The judge simply wants you to approach and ask for the jury to be excused so the admissibility can be argued outside the presence of the jury. So what ends up happening is that if you end up winning the motion in limine, 
opposing counsel at some point, if they wanna bring that fact up to, in front of the jury, they're first going to have to stand up, ask the court if they can approach both sides, both counsel will end up going up to the judge and the opposing counsel will simply say, your honor, at this point in time, I'm gonna to wanna to get into matters that were mentioned during the motion in limine and were ultimately granted. So I ask that the jury be excused so we can argue the admissibility to this particular fact or this particular piece of evidence. And it's at this point that the judge will look to the jury, ask for them to be excused, they'll leave, and then outside the presence of the jury, both lawyers will make their arguments and the judge will determine whether or not this fact or this piece of evidence is admissible. Keep in mind that the judge would probably prefer to make rulings on the admissibility of evidence at this point in time and not before trial whenever the motion limine is argued. That's because sometimes the other side can open up the door to a particular piece of evidence or a particular argument or sometimes the judge just wants to see the context of this particular piece of evidence or the arguments being brought, and that way the judge can better determine relevancy and whether or not that particular piece of evidence or the argument survives Rule 403. Let's go ahead and circle back to the beginning stages of a motion in limine. If your motion in limine was granted in whole or in part, then whatever was granted and needs to be understood to opposing counsel, that opposing counsel cannot make those arguments, and hopefully opposing counsel does understand that, and opposing counsel needs to instruct their witnesses not to talk about those particular facts or pieces of evidence and to simply not let it slip out of their mouths. That is something that's gonna be very, very important. Hopefully opposing counsel understands that and can make those instructions to their own witnesses, but you wanna make sure it's very, very clear to them and you wanna make those instructions potentially clear on the record. That way, if something does slip out, you know that opposing counsel was well aware of the instruction by the court to approach the bench and have the judge make the determination on the admissibility of the particular piece of unfairly prejudicial evidence outside the presence of the jury. Keep in mind, this is a two-way street. So if the other side ends up having issues granted in their motion to limine, be sure not to mention those and also instruct your witnesses not to let it slip whenever they're testifying. Now, in the event, if the other side ends up violating the motion to limine, this is a big deal you're gonna be kind of at a crossroads and you're gonna have to make a judgment call on how to handle this situation. On one hand, you can be super fired up and charged up and you can stand up and throw the chair back and get real angry and explain to the judge in open court in front of the jury what just happened. On the other hand, you can be calm, cool, and collected about it. I typically lean in favor of being calm, cool, and collected, and here's why. If a bad fact comes out in violation of emotion and limine, and if you stand up and you're fired up, you're gonna do two things. You're gonna one, you're gonna wake the jury up, and two, you're basically gonna be telling the jury indirectly by your own actions that this bad fact is true, and that's why you're being so defensive. On the other hand, if you take a much more chill approach, you may be able to alleviate that concern. By simply cutting off the testimony or cutting off the question by standing up immediately, quickly, but really calmly, and asking to approach the bench, and then asking as soon as you do approach the bench for the jury to be excused, that tells the jury, okay, something just happened, but I wasn't really paying attention to what it was. I didn't really have time to really play catch up in that moment. By the time it happened, they were already being asked to be excused. Well, if you're calm about it, they may also think, yeah, this is maybe a false statement or maybe this is true, I, I don't know. And then whenever they come back, if you end up winning on that particular issue, if the judge gives them that instruction, they may say, okay, clearly this wasn't an actual true fact or clearly this isn't an issue because the judge just instructed me not to consider it. At the same time, it's hard to unring that bell. So if the other side does violate the motion of limine, you're gonna have to make another judgment call of whether or not you wanna ask for a mistrial. Now, when it comes to a mistrial, this is kind of your last resort because if you're killing it in the courtroom, if you have a great jury, then maybe you just wanna continue on because with a mistrial, you're gonna to have to start over. You're gonna to have to get another trial setting. You're gonna to have to go through these hoops again and you're gonna to have to hope that you get either a good jury or a better jury. Now, there's always the situation where maybe you just have a bad jury in the next case. And that's a risk you're gonna to have to take if you end up asking for the mistrial and it ends up getting granted. But keep in mind, just because you're asking for the mistrial, the judge may not grant that particular mistrial. And then you're gonna also have to make the judgment call of, okay, do I wanna ask for the mistrial and preserve this objection on the record? 
If you don't ask for the mistrial, you may end up waiving whether or not you should have been granted the mistrial if you end up losing. This really complicates things and the judge should not be happy with opposing counsel for violating the motion in limine, but you're gonna have to make judgment calls all around and you may just wanna ask for a quick recess so you can talk to your client, explain the scenario to your particular client and figure out what your client is wanting to do. Putting aside the most extreme situation, let's go ahead and take a few seconds to go back to the beginning stages of a motion in limine to talk about two things. First, after both sides have exchanged their motions in limine before the hearing, it's worth seeing what y'all can agree on when it comes to agreeing to approach on certain matters. Keep in mind by agreeing to the other side's motion in limine in whole or in part, you're not saying that those particular pieces of evidence are inadmissible. Instead, you're just agreeing to approach the bench and to ultimately argue those facts or those pieces of evidence outside the presence of the jury. Now, the second thing I do wanna to touch on is make sure that your motion in limine is trim and as short as possible. You don't wanna to go to the judge with, I don't know, 200 bad facts and the judge get the impression that your client doesn't have a good case. I looked up the motion in limine to see who has been filing these motions in limine. And it's been the um, prosecutors. So I'm like, what y'all have up y'all sleeves on, on this seal motion in limine? So this last one has been sealed. And I'm like, What's, what, are, what do they have up their sleeve? They are trying so hard and making it so hard for his defense team. They're, um, even if they bring in, you know, um, professionals and stuff to do analysis and breakdowns and things like that, we don't know if they might try to, you know, shut that down. I mean, we, we just don't know. And the prosecutors, the government, the menu that they got working for them, they all are playing a dirty game to hurt one man. And they're trying to take down innocent people along with it, just so they can gain a win. And like I said, the RICO, and I keep saying this about the RICO, you know, what they do, they seize, and it's a money thing here. And it's a political thing. It's a it's a win thing. It's a, um, a sell um, selling the score thing. Um, we didn't. It's a me too thing. Um, so the women's rights thing. And you know, like I said, you know, we have to start changing some laws here because if we don't, just dealing with this a uh, year and some change, this has been a roller coaster. This has been a roller coaster ride, and I I find it just ridiculous to take this one man through all these changes and innocent people along with it. Remember, as a juror, your only job is to make sure justice is done, not to enforce bad laws. Five key points for jury heroes. You can find defendants not guilty even if they clearly broke the law. The judge is allowed to mislead or lie to you. You cannot be asked why you voted as you did. You cannot be punished for your verdict. And don't talk about jury power inside the courthouse. Part 1. Ensure justice for the defendant. That means you must judge the law as well as the facts. As a juror, you can legally vote not guilty to free someone who clearly broke a law you believe is unfair or involves unfair punishment. This is called jury nullification because the jury decides the bad law is null or nothing. You decide what justice is for your fellow citizen. And when enough juries refuse to convict good people for breaking bad laws, the bad laws go away. Part two, get on the jury. How to get from the jury summons to the jury box. First, you have to show up for jury duty. Second, dress average, be average. Wear clothing that's not too casual, not too dressy. Be polite to others, but not talkative, and occupy yourself with something neutral. Tell the truth during jury selection, sometimes called voir dire. Answer questions truthfully, but minimally. Say yes or no if possible. Don't volunteer extra information. If asked open-ended questions like how do you feel about or why, give very short, simple answers, and always show you're open-minded and fair. Agree to apply the law as given because you know that jury power is the law. 
Never talk or read about jury power in the courthouse, or you might be rejected as a juror. Part 3. Resist Intimidation and Manipulation It's okay to take the juror's oath, but remember, this is non-binding. A true verdict is one that's fair and just. Be willing to vote not guilty and free the defendant if the law is bad or punishment is unfair. Take expert witness testimony with a grain of salt. Don't be fooled by paid experts' technobabble. Don't assume law officers are truthful and accurate. Officers can forget or remember inaccurately on the stand. Always follow the jury conduct rules or you can be charged with contempt of court. Remember, the judge can mislead or even lie to you. So if he says, if evidence proves guilt, you must find the defendant guilty, that's false. If he says, you must follow the law as I explain it, even if you disagree, that's false. And if you ask him, what is jury nullification? And he says, there is no such thing, that is a lie. Don't let the judge tell you what verdict to decide. The jury's role is to judge the law as well as the facts to ensure justice. So if he says, you must follow all of my instructions, that's false. During deliberations, don't use or yield to pressure. Vote your conscience even if every other juror disagrees. Don't convict just because others want to go home. Don't pressure others to vote with you and don't talk about jury power. Be the kind of juror you'd want if you were on trial. If polled, simply say yes to agree with the verdict. If you've been pressured to accept a verdict you believe is unfair, you can say no here. The judge will either send the jury back to deliberate longer or will declare a mistrial. It's completely legal and safe for you to vote your conscience. You can never be asked why you voted the way you did and you can't be punished for your verdict. Part 4. Jury Power Court Affirmed for Over 200 Years Here's what the courts have said about jury power. The jury has a right to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. A right of jury trial is granted to criminal defendants in order to prevent oppression by the government. The pages of history shine on instances of the jury's exercise of its prerogative to disregard evidence and instructions of the judge. Jurors have amazing power. More than police, lawyers, judges, state legislators, more than Congress, and even more than the president. But most courts won't tell you about your power. In fact, they'll punish any attorney that tries to tell you about your power in the courtroom, and they'll dismiss any juror who tells others about jury power, even though it's been legal for over 200 years. So it's up to all of us to spread the word. But how? Educate everybody you know. Give out literature, participate in outreach events, share videos and articles online, encourage everyone to show up for jury duty, lead by example, and share news of juries setting good people free. Remember, your only job as a juror is to ensure justice, not to enforce bad laws. You must judge the law as well as the facts. You never have to say why you voted as you did, and you can't be punished for your verdict. We can just hope that you have 12 people selected with morals, values, and respect for human life and knowing and honoring the right to a fair trial and to hear both sides because there's only been one side of the story, as we know, um, even with the people that's trying to come in and you know give their opinions or give information and facts and you know pointing out the lies from the truth to try to help um, Robert Sylvester Kelly it has been unfair um, they have gone to the extreme to stop any and everybody that's trying to point out the lies from the truth to help him you know have a, his side out and, you know, we only can just, you know, pray that, you know, we have human beings sitting up there and they're not, they're leaving all the opinions and, you know, things out the door and just stepping in and blocking everything that they know about outside of the court, leave it outside of the court, sit there and hear the evidence and hope that the judge 
is a fair referee and let both teams play fair, you know. Um, it shouldn't be just like it is on the outside. It shouldn't be a one-sided thing here. Um, he has every right to sit there in that courtroom and present himself and defend himself, and they have the right to allow that so the 12 U.S. citizens can hear it and make their decisions when they go into the room, you know, and go over all the evidence and, you know, with each other and, you know, just hopefully that these prosecutors and the feds are not trying to, you know, mute these um, 12 men and women because they're trying to place people in that box. So let's just, you know, pray, pray for that as well. Google shared search data with feds investigating R. Kelly victim intimidation case. Published by Newsbreak. Google disclosed the IP addresses of anyone who searched for an arson victim's address to the federal agents, which investigators used to pinpoint the device used by the alleged perpetrator, according to court documents unsealed earlier in the week, highlighting another instance of Google submitting to a so-called keyword warrant. Next. Related. Google shared search data with feds investigating R. Kelly Williams, an associate of musician and accused sex offender R. Kelly, who allegedly set fire to the car belonging to a witness in the Kelly case, according to snippets of the court filings shared by Detroit News reporter Robert Snell. Keyword warrants are a type of reverse search warrant in which law enforcement seeks data regarding all individuals searching for specific phrases online that can then be used to narrow down suspects. Typical search warrants require probable cause and are often associated with a suspect or an address. Keyword warrants however give up data on a large group of data based on the fact that they may have searched for specific phrases. CNET reports that after investigators were able to tie Williams to the arson through the keyword warrant, they sent Google another warrant specifically seeking data from the suspect's account, and found that he had searched for phrases including, where can I buy a .50 custom machine gun? witness intimidation, and countries that don't have extradition with the United States. Evan Greer, the deputy director of the human rights group Fight for the Future, told Forbes, such warrants are dragnet surveillance and it should be illegal. No one should be targeted by law enforcement based solely on an internet search. Greer added that the incident was a perfect example of how Google's corporate surveillance, collecting and storing information about the things we search for, can easily be used to power authoritarian government surveillance. It's one more reason to use alternative search engines that don't track or monitor what you search for. Todd Spodick, the attorney representing Williams told Forbes that, the keyword warrants run afoul of the Fourth Amendment and allow the feds to have unfettered access to private citizens' search history who merely searched relevant terms. Spodick also noted that the issue has come up during Williams's bail application and if the warrant is overturned it will impact the entire case. According to the CNET report, Google has received 15 times more geofence warrant requests in 2018 compared with 2017, and five times more in 2019 than in 2018. These geofence warrants are similar to keyword warrants where police make requests for user location data at specific times instead of what content they searched. Google's staffers have been concerned by the rise in requests of such reverse warrants. Internal emails shared by Arizona's Attorney General in August show. In 2017, Forbes reported that a judge in Minnesota has signed off on a warrant allowing police to demand Google data on anyone who searched for the name of a fraud victim across the whole city of Edina. Google is giving data to police based on search keywords, court docs show, CNET. Cops demand Google data on anyone who searched a person's name. Across a whole city, Forbes. Okay, you have people just panicking, panicking, panicking. And, and like I said, this is a one-sided thing. So if you listen to the article, if you read the articles and things like that, you hear them saying uh, this person is related to Robert Sylvester Kelly. And this man is not related to Robert Sylvester Kelly. And um, I'm going to keep 
putting that out there. Like I said, this is a Cash Jones, Angelo, Clary, and Cousin Beef, okay? And so, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to paint this narrative that, you know, um, with, even with Don Russell, with um, Cash Jones, um, with, with that situation, and, you know, all of these um, people um, that they're trying to merge them into Robert's case. And they're trying to persuade Judge Ann to do what she did with the with the with the you know anonymous jurors. And so I'm like, wow. But um this is nothing new. Um you have the FBI, you have um you know the the feds and stuff, you know, always, you know, getting warrants for, you know, Google searches. You have them, you know, getting warrants for like phone records and social media, you know, um deals and stuff like that that's nothing new um like i said um a lot of people that has gotten involved in doing their research um in this case um they see what a lot of people see they see a lot of you know lies a lot of fabrication inconsistencies everybody you know switching their stories and, and they started getting interested in it as you know you know, as soon as people started putting information, pointing out the lies from the truth, then you had, you know, other people like, oh, my God, this is what's going on. So they go in and they'll type it in and or they'll hear a story about uh, a, a person that claimed to be involved um, with him. And then, you know, they'll search him. And so if these are Jane Doe's. And you guys then put that information out there. You prosecutors are not giving it to the defense team. How could you say and why would you say that um, people are out here intimidating witnesses? And once again, this is a Cash Jones, Angelo Clary, and Cousin Beef. Nothing to do with um, Robert. Okay? So that needs to be um, brought to, the, the, uh, to their attention as well. Um, people need to just constantly put that out there, you know, about Cash Jones and Angelo Clary and their alleged entanglement that he's upset about, okay? So, um, at the end of the day, you know, I do my research. I do a lot of Googling. I have been um, in this fight since last year, and I have been researching everybody. I also Google about... Um, crime lords and uh, mafia and, and and things like that and just because I'm looking it up so I'm looking to see how the mafia and the crime lords you know doing crime or how they killing people no when I did that search that search was to um, do a video do one of my commentaries to ask the question why are you guys trying to treat him like he's a crime lord and a gangster um you have gangsters that y'all letting out on bail letting out doing um during this um corona virus pandemic but you have a man that's just sitting there awaiting trial and you guys are holding him in there so that's what my search is about i have not i never delete my um searches you guys because i always want to go back and s see what i searched so i'm I can go back and push it, you know, and maybe it'll take me back to what I was looking for because I've been doing a lot of research on a lot of things. And that doesn't make me, you know, looking up something to go out and do some harm to someone, to a Jane Doe I don't know anything about. I am going to continue to point out the lies from the truth. Um, they can continue to be posting things like that, and I'm going to continue to come back and give my opinion and how I feel about it as well. So I'm going to continue to um, to fight this fight. And the reason I became one of Robert's soldiers is because there are three sides to every story. I do believe the law needs to be followed, both on the prosecutor's side and on the defense. I'm not here to ask 
anybody, nor have I ever asked anybody to have sympathy for him. This isn't about having sympathy. This is about a man who is being accused of several things. Granted, none of them are good things that anyone would ever want to be sitting in his chair for. But it is astounding how many people have already judged him. So that's what's so fascinating too, is I believe that this case is absolutely setting precedence. In the United States, the wheels turn based on precedent. And unfortunately for Robert, he is the guinea pig of precedence when it comes to the hashtag Me Too movement. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Don't forget to continue to write inspirational letters to Robert and you guys have a great one.